All right. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the BIPOC Excellence Leadership in Sport webinar. On behalf of TMU Bold, thank you for joining us this evening, and we are so pleased to have you here. Um, my name is Sage Catchway. I'm a student at Toronto Metropolitan University. I'm also a member of the TMU Bold women's hockey team, and I will be your facilitator for this webinar this evening. So thanks again. We have a packed lineup for you tonight. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, we will begin our webinar by welcoming our special guest, TMU Bold women's soccer student athlete, Jayla Frazier. Uh, during Black History Month, Jayla shared an inspiring original poem on the beauty of being Black, despite the stereotypes, judgment, and racism they face on a daily basis. Um, here to share her poem with you tonight, please welcome Jayla Frazier. Thank you, Sage. Hi, guys. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys a little insight on the poem before I get started. Um, I started writing it back a couple of years ago. I wrote like the first verse and um, I got inspired by um, Biggie, the notorious B.I.G. Um, and his song Hypnotize, where um, he says, Biggie, 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 can't you see? Sometimes your words just hypnotize me. Um, so that's where I got that little chorus where I say, Black is beautiful, can't you see? Um, I thought that was really powerful. So I wanted to put that in there and make sure it repeats. And although this poem specifically pertains to Black people and the beauty and their pigmentation, you can see when heard that ultimately it can represent anybody, any color, any nationality at the end of the day. It's knowing that um, who you are is beautiful regardless of what those around you say. And I feel like it's important for me to not try and instill that into the Black community, but recognize it and acknowledge it and continue to talk about it because it's something that some people can get lost in in this world that we live in um, and forget that like there's beauty in who we are as people and especially within the black community. So I feel that it should be heard often and should be known that we are beautiful despite everything. Awesome, thank you so much for your introduction. Um, please go ahead. Okay. Do you know, black is beautiful, can't you see? Cause I know my skin color is the beauty, ain't no beast. We don't mean no harm cause all we want is peace, but the world that we live in tries so hard to just deceive. Black is beautiful, can't you see? The melanin deeply rooted like trees. We have planted our seeds, they lay under our feet and sprout when it's time to use our minds and who we are for good. There is no reason why we should be misunderstood. Discover, our color is rich and smooth like butter. We are like no other, a very capable cluster of the human race. Black is beautiful, can't you see? We are not what we are set out to be. Our complexion shouldn't be an excuse for a catastrophe. The stereotypes need to be set free. It's time to live a good life where the judgment from beneath is dug out and thrown out. No time for bold melts and harsh comments. Our words and actions lead to a better prospect for a better process and formula to live together as one. Black is beautiful, can't you see? We must ingrain this into the younger generation's dictionaries. They must know that there is nothing wrong with who they are. Acceptance can go very far and set the bar. Higher than the stars, we shine bright. Black is beautiful, can't you see? No one should alter your belief. We all come in different shades, which unfortunately causes a lot of hate and opens up room to discriminate and segregate. However, we need to switch our views. Know that there is beauty in our pigmentation. It should be a celebration, not a deformation of one's character. Black is beautiful, can't you see? But some people can't. Society has formed their opinions of us. We all look tough and problematic. There are addicts to the set notions which act like potions. It is these exact people who can't look beyond. They're so far gone. So no, black is beautiful, but everyone cannot see. Black is beautiful, I'll tell you that for free. It's all about belting this fact, knowing it's not whack, but rather the truth. Regardless of what those around you extract and say, black is beautiful every day by Jayla C. Frazier.
Beautiful. Um, so this poem was created in celebration of Black History Month in February. Um, Jayla, can you tell us what Black History Month means to you? Sure. So um, I don't really look at Black History Month as just a month. I always try and look at it as something that I want to learn. I want to learn about Black history every day of every month around the whole year. And I feel like that should be like the outlook for everybody, whether it's Black History Month, Truth and Reconciliation Day. I think we should look at everything as something we're learning and continuing to learn every day. Beautiful. Jayla, uh, I believe you're just so well-spoken. Um, I believe it's an absolute honor to have you share your poem and experiences uh, with us. Um, and I just wanna thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you guys for listening. Of course. Um, now I would like to introduce our second guest. She is the co-founder and executive director of Black Girl Club Canada and the founder of Soroya, Soroya Strong Mentorship Program. A former NCAA Division I athlete at Yale University and currently com competing in the Premier Hockey Federation with the Toronto Six, please join me in welcoming Soroya Tinker. Hey everyone, thanks for having me and thank you Jayla for the awesome poem. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Um, I just want to congratulate you and your team with advancing to the Isabel Cup finals. Um, for the audience, the Toronto Six beat out Connecticut this Wednesday at our Mattamy Home Ice, and we'll be heading to Arizona this weekend to play for the Isabel Cup. So we wish you all the best. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, hosting us this weekend at the Mattamy Center, and uh, we're headed to Arizona tomorrow morning. So coming home to, to bring the Isabel Cup to Toronto. <laughs> I mean, of course, I mean, that's the plan. Um, before we begin, I just wanna let the audience know that we are accepting questions for the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, so just please use the chat function to submit your questions throughout the event. Um, so to start off our conversation this evening, uh, I wanna start off with a quote that sort of frames the landscape of participating in sport in Canada. Um, sport in Canada was designed for white men's participation. Um, to jump right in, Soroya, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I definitely agree with this quote. I think that um, like many things we see in our society and in our world, um, it is created and has been created by white men. Um, so in that sense, I, I think that our, our sport has been created for men, whether that's white men or or black men. Um, and I mean, I think us women um, are quite often left out of the sport conversation and, and we're just starting to get a seat at the table now. Absolutely. Um, let's take a look at some additional facts uh, to further set the stage. Um, so referencing some key stats and takeaways from the Ontario University Athletics 2021 Anti-Racism Report, um, which was conducted by Dr. Janelle Joseph in the Ideas Research Lab at University of Toronto. According to the report, 73% of respondents from over 5,000 OUA members identified as white. 71.3% of student athletes identified as white, 78.5% of coaches identified as white, and 81.1% of administrators identified as white. Hmm. Some acts of racism in the OUA have included unfair hiring and recruit recruitment practices, ignorance and denial of racism from white athletes and staff, um, microaggressions and assumptions and stereotypes, tokenisms and added labor to racialize athletes and staff, limited funding and awards to BIPOC individuals, and lack of anti-racism policies report and reporting processes. Um, Soroya, I know you played in uh, college hockey in the States, um, but let's first discuss what are your thoughts when you see statistics like this? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the first thing that comes to mind is, is how concerning this is. Um, obviously, I think the, the stats would be a little bit different in the States, but at the same time, uh, I mentioned having a seat at the table um, a little earlier. So um, I, I think that that's, that's a lot to have to do with this. So um, we see in terms of coaches and administrators, those are the people that get to make the big decisions and get to recruit. And then once the recruiting happens, those are the players that are the 71% of white athletes. So um, 
Um, in that sense, it's, it's concerning because it doesn't represent our demographic here in Ontario um, and, and specifically not in this in the GTA region. So um, in, in that sense, I, I think we need more seats at the table. We need um, to see those numbers decrease and I mean, obviously increase in the in the BIPOC communities because we are obviously aware that these BIPOC individuals do enjoy competing in sport and, and deserve uh, to be competing at this level as well. So um, I think it's time that we obviously open our eyes in, in terms of recruiting, but also making sure that we're hiring um, people in positions of power uh, to make those decisions and, and bring BIPOC individuals to the table, to the court, to the field, whatever it may be. Yeah, of course. I know I completely agree. And do you feel these statistics are applicable to college athletics in the United States? Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure what the, what the stats in the States look like, but um, I think obviously uh, football is a, is a huge contributor in, in, uh, in the States. So, I mean, I, I think in that regard, the numbers may be slightly different, but at the same time at the top, uh, these numbers, I mean, are most likely even worse, to be honest, um, in terms of allowing people into um, higher positions like coaching and administrator of uh, administrative director at a university and, and whatnot. So um, in, in that sense, I, I don't see um, a huge discrepancy across the border. Um, obviously, playing in the States and things that I experience there are a little different than, than what I experience in Canada. But at the same time, um, these, these stats are, are nationally known. And um, I, I think it's important that we're, we're diving into them and, and making sure that we're making an effort to change them. Um, because anyone looking at these numbers should look and see that this is concerning because diversity is, is a superpower. And the more... Um, the more we do bring voices to the table and the more we do have people of color speaking up and, and able to express their opinions, the better we're going to be. And I think we need to realize that. No, thank you so much. Um, moving on to the next slide, let's recap some of the most significant barriers that impact racialized athletes in the OUA. So racialized athletes are less likely to receive funding or financial support from caregivers, um, full or partial athletic awards. Racialized athletes are often faced with assumptions and stereotypes about their race, which can discourage them from participating in their sports. Um, many racialized athletes have expressed feeling tokenized and not supported by their coaches and peers. Um, when instances of racism occurred, they felt that leaders would misunderstand their feelings and concerns and the problem wouldn't be dealt with correctly. Soroya, do you have any of your own similar experiences or what do you think the most significant challenges marginalized athletes face? Yeah, I think um, for for my experiences, my experiences are probably amplified as a as a black woman playing a a, a, a t predominantly white sport, um, that being hockey. So, um, it, in that sense, obviously we see the financial barriers specifically within hockey, um, but obviously within other areas of sport as well. So, I mean, I think the financial barrier is is one that um, has to be addressed from the grassroots program, um, grassroots uh, programming and and whatnot that we implement within our cities. Um, but at the same time, these stereotypes. And, you know, not being able to fit in with your team or um, having these racialized situations and feeling alone. Um, I think that these stats that we just looked at earlier show that uh, these students are alone. Um, they may be the only one or one of two on their team. And um, I think that that leads to players and, 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 uh, and these students being overlooked. And I think that that goes on to um, accountability and how we're able to speak up as, as racialized individuals within sport um, and feel Feeling like we can do so when so many of our our counterparts and the people who are above us in sport are white and don't necessarily understand where we're coming from. So um, in terms of barriers and, and access, I think that there are so many barriers that we can knock down, um, whether that's just financially or, you know, educating ourselves further and having those accountability steps and um, actually putting those those practices into action. Um, but at the same time, there there's so much more that goes into barriers and access than just finances. Um, we see it day in and day out more than just in hockey. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more. Um, I want to talk a little bit about intersectionality for a moment here. So by definition, intersectionality is the complex cumulative way in which the effects of multiple forms of discrimination, such as racism, sexism, and classism, combined and overlap, especially in experiences of marginalized individuals or groups. I think it's important to note that 
the intersection of race and gender does not mean they are two separate identities within one person. This idea coined by Kimberly Kenshaw notes that being black and a woman are not experiences, not experienced as two separate things. These identities are linked and impact how a person and or athlete is perceived by the peers and the world. In terms of the applications of intersectionality in sport, it is often, often overlooked. Reports and studies on inequalities in Canada and Canadian sports and physical activity often overlook how racialization intersects with other social identities. There is little research outside of race, class, and gender on how intersectional identities and barriers are experienced. Some examples would be the LGBTQ community in sport, ableist Muslim sports, childcare, elder care, and social groups. Um, racialized women are especially excluded from sport due to the conjunction of sexism and racism. Soraya, can you speak to the experience of competing as a racialized woman in Canada, or sorry, in hockey, and your experience in the United States, was it different from in Canada? Yeah, so I mean, I guess I'll, I'll start by saying I, I grew up playing um, in Clarington, um, so just east of Toronto, and at that time, um, I was playing boys hockey, and um, I, at that time, I just realized that I was a girl playing hockey, um, getting dressed in a different dressing room and, you know, not being able to have that team atmosphere with the boys. Um, but then as I moved to girls hockey, um, obviously I was on the girls team, but I also realized that my teammates saw me differently because I was a black woman and I didn't look like the rest of them. Um, so, I mean, I would say the majority of my experiences that I've had with racism um, and, you know, the lack of understanding of, of what it means to be a Black woman in hockey um, have occurred in Canada, if I'm being honest. So um, the thought and the uh, the assumption that racism doesn't occur in Canada is obviously um, incorrect. And I mean, I think that we as Canadians need to dive deeper in, into that and, and realize that there are deeply rooted issues within our, our side of the border as well. Um, so in that regard, I think being in the States, um, I think a lot of things are more blunt and in your face in, in the states in terms of news and um and, and that regard but at the same time um canada has has hidden a lot of ours so um i i think in in that regard we we need to look deeper into how these intersections are, are coming into sport coming into the workplace um and and how we're going to implement them moving forward just because um these intersections are so important um and they're important because it allows for so many different points of views um um, and I think that that's something that I've really wanted to do and implement in my work. And that's why we have Black Girl Hockey Club now. So um, obviously we welcome everybody in Black Girl Hockey Club, but more specifically, it's a space for Black women in hockey um, because we have been excluded. Amazing. Um, again, so well-spoken. Um, and I think what you're doing here is uh, very important as we progress uh, in sport and in Canada. Um, I want to quick fire some questions about your upbringing um, a little bit. So you were born and raised in Oshawa, correct? Yes, I was. I grew up in Oshawa um, and I went to Monsignor Paul Dwyer Catholic High School. <laughs> Amazing. And um, how old were you when you started playing hockey? Um, I started skating probably around the age of three or four and started playing hockey at six or seven. Amazing. And what made you want to start playing hockey? Um, my dad made me want to start playing. Um, so my dad actually grew up in Scarborough and, and loved playing hockey. Um, obviously, Scarborough has a huge historic um, history in terms of, of, of hockey and whatnot. So uh, playing roller hockey, ball hockey, uh, my dad just had a love for the game. I always loved the Leafs. So uh, that's how I got into, into playing hockey. <laughs> Great. Um, so do you have a coach from youth hockey that has made a lasting impact on you today? Yeah, I, I think I, I've had this question come up actually recently. Um, and one of the coaches that I've mentioned is Perry Wilson. Um, so Perry Wilson is a goalie coach with Hockey Canada, and he is one of the only black men that works in this uh, in the Hockey Canada space. So I remember going to uh, U18 national team camp and Perry was there and we were one of we were two of three black people who were at our camp. Um, and although my parents weren't there to watch, 
watch and whatnot. And I was the only black woman there. Um, I knew that Perry was silently rooting for me um, as much as he may not have been supposed to be. Um, at the same time, um, I knew he was in my corner uh, and I always remember Perry to this day. And um, he was definitely a big motivator in me ensuring that I had a spot on that U18 team and making sure that I had enough confidence to do so. <laughs> Amazing. So uh, say he listens to this. Is he the favorite coach? Yes, for yes. sure. <laughs> points. Um, so moving forward, this quote is from the 2019 anti-racism in hockey policy paper. Um, quote, hockey is no more or less racist than any other sport. It is the symptomatic of society in which whiteness is assumed as a universal cultural reference point. What this quote explains is that whiteness is not only embedded, but it is assumed in the world of hockey. Deviance from this quote unquote standard of whiteness uh, can make on BIPOC athletes, coaches, and administrators targets of harassment. Soraya, what are your thoughts on this ref on this statement? And do you agree? Do you disagree? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we just see how far behind hockey is. Um, as much as we may think that hockey is 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 more racist or or I mean less racist than some sports, I don't know who would think that. But um, <laughs> in that sense, I think that uh, we need to realize that hockey hasn't allowed people into the sport. Um, we allow them to come in, maybe try it out, and then they we we push them out so that they don't make it to that next level. Um, there's so much secrecy that goes into the sport of hockey um, and I mean I think that that goes into all around accessibility so whether it's the financial barriers the networking barriers um, that these BIPOC kids have to go through um, hockey is is so exclusive and we're so far from um, so many other sports just because of how exclusive it is um, I always use the example of, uh, you know, Usain Bolt on skates or LeBron James on skates. Um, so in, in that sense, I know that some people have just said, oh, well, well, black individuals just aren't in, interested in hockey. Um, but the truth is that a lot of these young girls that I talk to and young boys that I get to get to see the hockey wasn't even offered to them. Um, it was, hey, do you want to play basketball? Um, they didn't even know that it was an option for them to play hockey, let alone see representation in the NHL. So so um, hockey has so far to go. And um, I, I do, I mean, I, I, I don't necessarily, I, I do think hockey is, is, is more racist than, than other sports, but um, it's, it's just done a poor job of, of letting people into uh, its atmosphere and its realm um, just because of how exclusive the, the atmosphere is and um, how, how racist some of the examples that we can pull out really are. Yeah. And I, I just want to appreciate your, your honesty to this and your experiences. Uh, I think it's very valuable to have this conversation. Um, mm -hmm. Moving forward, you graduated from Yale with a Bachelor of Arts uh, in the history of science, medicine, and public health. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think your degree has benefited you today and in your career? Yeah, so I mean, I, I feel like I am asked this question a bit. So I'm I'm not currently, I don't feel as though I'm currently using my degree. Um, but at the same time, I always had an interest in in medicine and, and health and, and specifically black women's health. So I actually chose to focus my thesis on um the mental health of black female athletes and how um that's been systemically ingrained in us in terms of our body image, our mental health and wellness and whatnot. So um in that sense, I I've done extensive of research on the black female body. So um, as I move forward and play hockey um, as an athlete and, and a mentor, um, I, I think I just really understand and I see the ways that black women have been ignored and, and not welcomed into spaces. And I've seen the ways that I've been ignored and not welcomed into spaces. And, and I know the way that I've felt. And that's not a way that I want anybody to feel. Um, whether you're black, white, whatever, whatever you may be, um, that's not something that anyone should have to feel or go through. So in, in that regard, I, I think my degree has, has helped me um, learn to do research, obviously all of the little things that school helps you do, but um, it's helped me develop a, a, um, a real uh, passion for helping black women, um, whether that's as a, as a mentor, as a life coach, as a wellness coach, um, as a trainer, hockey coach, whatever it may be. Um, I think that that's what my degree has, has currently helped me do. Uh, we've got it tucked in the back pocket for when we retire. <laughs> Absolutely. 
you know, and I think it's important to have people like you bring the conversation into um, these educational institutions. So amazing. <laughs> um, I understand that you joined Yale University hockey program back in 2016, and you played there for four years. I'm curious, um, in what ways did you take on a leadership role while being on the team and in the community of Yale? Yeah, so I mean, team wise, I, I think I'm, um, I've always been a, a, a kind of a leader who leads by example and, and only really speaks up when I need to and, and feel like something's really been out of place. So um, in, in that regard, I think I was always a, a leader on my team in terms of the way I played and the work ethic I put in. Um, and unfortunately, being with my team, I, I honestly wasn't comfortable being a leader on my Yale team. Um, they weren't necessarily the people that I wanted to be a leader for or, you know, put my put my role on the line for them just because I knew that they wouldn't necessarily do that for me. Um, so in terms of my leadership roles at Yale, um, I was on the Yale Black Women's Coalition, so uh, we would find ways in which we could help the New Haven community um, as Black women and, and reach out to the Black women within New Haven. As, as, as if you don't know, um, New Haven has a very large Black community off of Yale's campus. Um, and I honestly had to look into different communities at Yale to, to make those leadership positions for myself and uh, make sure that I was involved in different communities. So uh, my two best friends were on the soccer team. Um, I mentioned Yale Black Women's Coalition. I was on YSAC, which is the um, Student Athlete Council. So um, getting to put my word in there. And then um, I was also in a sorority at Yale. So in, in, that, in that regard, I think... Um, I, I wanted to lead, but hockey wasn't necessarily my space to lead specifically while I was at Yale. Um, I definitely see myself as a leader now back in the hockey community, being on a welcoming um, and inclusive team with the Toronto Six, though. Amazing. No, you're so heavily decorated and um, very, very inspirational. Um, you know, you kind of touched on it, but like, are there do these skills and experiences, uh, did they help you in the creation of Black Girl Hockey Club and your mentorship program? For sure. Yeah. I mean, um, for, for those who don't know, um, I mean, being a professional hockey player, I mean, I guess is my first real job. Um, and my second first real job is, is running black girl hockey club Canada. So as a, as a new, new grad, 25 year old, um, I've learned so much about nonprofit organizations, charitable status, um, nonprofit paperwork, the business side of things. So, um, obviously I didn't study business, but, uh, at the same time, this is something that I've really enjoyed growing, um, whether that's just the general community and communication with the girls to the tedious, annoying paperwork that we have to do in terms of nonprofits and boards. So um, in that sense, I've I've learned so much and I feel like I've I've learned um, more than I could have um, if I were to study business and be implementing that now. So I'm happy that I didn't study business and I'm choosing to do this. So um, I, I think sport is is an avenue and it's, it's opened up so many doors for me. And um, obviously hockey has opened up this door for me and that's to help little black girls play hockey um and start black girl hockey club canada amazing um after yale you moved on to join the metropolitan riveters for the national women's hockey league now premier hockey federation um i believe it was also around the same time that you founded black girl hockey club canada um can you talk about the process of starting this new chapter in canada and what are the main goals of the organization today for sure. So my senior year of college, um, I was going through a pretty tough time. And just as any mom does, my mom reached out and was trying to find organizations that I could get involved in and feel included in. And Black Girl Hockey Club was one of those organizations. So Black Girl Hockey Club was founded by Renee Hess. Um, it was originally a California based nonprofit. And it was really just a space for Black women to come together to watch hockey. Um, Renee had never been on skates. She just loves Malkin um, and loves the Pittsburgh Penguins. So in, in that sense, she just wanted some girls to go to the game with. Um, 
So with that, my parents and my two younger brothers went to Pittsburgh to the their first Black Girl Hockey Club meetup. And at their at their game, my mom mentioned that I was at Yale playing. Um, and Renee was super surprised. She had no idea and didn't know who I was. Um, didn't know didn't know that Black girls played hockey at Yale. Um, and right then uh, we got in contact. I started volunteering on the scholarship committee, and I just really loved seeing the girls' reactions um, to winning the scholarships, but reading their applications applications as well and getting to know them um, as players and as people. So um, in, in that sense, as soon as I was done at Yale, um, I decided to start my mentorship program, Soroya Strong, and uh, I was also going to play pro hockey for the Riveters. And at that point, I wanted to raise money for the scholarship fund. So I made it my goal to, to raise $5,000 in the NWHL bubble that season, and we were able to raise $32,000. Uh, so this past November uh, in 2022, we just launched Black Girl Hockey Club Canada officially as a nonprofit organization in Canada. And, um, and the main goals of the organization, honestly, are, are just a, it, we're called a club for a reason. Um, I think a lot of times people think that we're on the ice and, um, you know, we're doing that. It's it's a club. It's a space. Um, it's a welcoming space for these Black girls to have friends, to have a community, to have the networking, the connections. Um, and I mean, in that sense, we want to make sure that Black girls can play hockey at any age. Um, and we are so excited to be implementing our community programming here in Canada. Amazing. Well, I just want to congratulate you about that. I was completely unaware, but um, I I think we will all be following you in support um, from here on. Thank you. Um, I want to take a quick moment here to pause and remind the audience. Um, submit a question in the chat for the Q&A portion at the end. Um, we have time flying by here and we're quickly approaching the end. Um, now, I we, we look at hockey as an entity in Canada, and it's important to acknowledge the barriers that prevent youth enrollment, uh, the primary barrier being cost. Um, the cost of equipment, league fees, tournament and travel fees quickly add up. Um, here are some stats. So hockey elite players in Canada are increasingly from the Canadian, Canadian white collar professional demographic. Um, Average cost as of 2011 and 2012 is $3,000 on minor hockey per season, approximately $15,000 for AAA competitions and hockey uh, acad academics, um, league fees, equipment, travel costs can push total spending to about $30,000 per season. Um, as noted, cost is a significant barrier to play hockey in Canada. Uh, Soraya, how do you address that with Black Girl Hockey Club Canada? Yeah, so obviously we see here that hockey is so expensive. Um, in regards to a lot of other sports, you just need a ball and a pair of shoes um, and and whatnot. So in, in hockey, you do need all the equipment and the league fees are super expensive. Um, so in regards to addressing that with Black Girl Hockey Club, uh, we have our scholarship program as well as our financial aid program and our equipment aid program. So the idea with the scholarship program is to fund our um, high level um, athletes that will be playing in college. So division one, D3, um, U sports, whatever it may be. Um, so the, those scholarships will be given out once a year um, to five of the older girls. And then we have five rising star scholarships. And then financial aid can be given out uh, is, is on a rolling basis. Um, so Financial aid can be given out to anyone throughout any point of time throughout the year. Um, the girls can apply um, at any age. So the other day we just had a 27 year old that applied for um, some equipment. She wants to learn how to play hockey. Um, so in that sense, uh, black women of all ages can apply for equipment or financial aid to fund their careers. And then with equipment aid, um, equipment aid just helps in return in, in regards to, hey, um, I instead of I need $1,000 for a pair of skates, I need um, um, I just need a pair of skates. So we're able to give the, the give the participants um, the equipment that they need. Um, and then if they do need help with the financial aid side, uh, then they can apply for financial aid. But that's how we're addressing it um, here. But we, we do see that so many young children need help with their fees. And uh, I personally know how much my parents um, struggled when I was growing up in, in regards to me playing in, in those AAA competitions and, you know, playing in the summer and needing extra ice. And that's what hockey is all about. And it's as sad as it may be. Um, you do need that extra ice. Now you do need a skating coach. You do need to go to shooting 
practice and whatever else it may be. So um, those extras are not um, added into the $3,000 you play, pay at the beginning of the season. Um, and it's so important that we we realize that hockey is such an expensive sport and, and it's so important that we help aid the Black women that want to play hockey. Amazing. So it's clear that scholarships are a big part of the Black Girl Hockey Club. Um, what benefits do you think that these scholarships are offering uh, young female hockey players? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll give you an example. So for, for this year, our scholarships on the Canadian side do run a little bit differently than Black Girl Hockey Club US. Um, US gives out their scholarships quarterly, whereas we're giving ours at once a year. So um, I'll use myself as an example. So when I was at Yale, I had the highest financial aid package on my team. Um, so for those who don't know, Ivy League schools only give out financial aid. They don't give out athletic scholarships. So I did still have to pay to attend Yale. Um, but with that being said, I had a high financial aid package, which meant that I was required to have a job on campus. So on top of playing hockey, on top of attending class, um, I needed to have a job because Yale was giving me X amount of money. Um, and we see that these are just ways that they systemic systemically keep people down in, in terms of BIPOC communities. Um, so Dayton is our mentee that will be attending uh, Dartmouth University come September. And with her financial aid package, I know that she's going to be going to have to have a job as well. Um, but if given a scholarship, she's going to be able to just focus on school and hockey. Um, and for myself, that's that was something that only only myself on my team was required to have a job for, for my class anyways. Um, and I, I think it's important that she is able to just focus on hockey. So um, that's a way that these scholarships are helping these girls. Um, and I mean, I, on, on top of that, it's, it's encouraging them. Um, it's making sure that they are seen and heard in the space, regardless of whether they're seen and heard by their coaches or teammates. Um, and we're able to celebrate them um, as they deserve to be celebrated. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, I understand that Black Girl Hockey Camp Mentorship Program uh, is run in partnership with another organization, uh, Soroya Strong Mentorship Program. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to quickly uh, rapid fire some questions about that as well. So who is eligible, eligible to join this program and what can you offer them? Yeah, so um, any BIPOC women in sport um, from the ages 9 to 21 can join. Uh, we operate off of Slack and uh, we offer monthly newsletters um, and uh, anyone is eligible, to be honest. <laughs> Amazing. Um, throughout the mentorship program, uh, what tools are you using to foster community and connect athletes to one another? Yeah, so like I just said, we operate off of Slack. So um, we just are getting used to Slack this year. Um, but this is a way for our girls to create group messages with each other, um, for me to grab them out of the group chat and, you know, put them in a group chat with somebody else that, you know, maybe they had the same coach and they got to talk about a coach for the following year. Um, it's, hey, I'm going to be in your city for a tournament. Do you want to grab lunch? Um, so these girls are able to connect um, either with their phone numbers or via Slack. Um, and we also offer virtual um, workouts uh, and, and whatnot. So virtual guest speakers and a lot of our meetings will operate virtually. Um, but at the same time, there's about 125 girls who have registered for the program and um, are both in Canada and the US. And now obviously the girls who are in the GTA get get most of the in-person attention, but as I'm flying around and playing with the Toronto Six, if I'm in Boston or as I'm in Arizona, um, the girls will uh, receive an email saying, hey, Soroy is going to be here. If you want to watch a uh, PHF game, um, let us know and we'll get you tickets. So um, in that sense, there's so many ways these girls can can be connected and, and be together in the community. Amazing. Um, you're just reflecting such commitment to this. And I think that is so important. Um, what can we expect for Black Girl Hockey Camp in the future? And what new programs do you currently have in the works? Yeah, so um, so for Black Girl Hockey Club, we currently have our two programs uh, running, which are our scholarship financial aid and equipment aid, and then our mentorship program. And then in the in the future, um, I know I've talked quite a bit about um, my mental health and wellness. So we will be implementing a mental health and wellness program, and then we will be implementing more community events. So um, those are ways for our girls to come together, whether it's watching a hockey game or um, having hair care sessions and learning how to take care of their curls. Um, so there's so many ways that we want to implement these programs in the future. But uh, the mental health and wellness program and the community events are what we'll be implementing come 20. 
Amazing. Um, again, just such inspirational stuff um, and sounds like just such a great thing and fun to be a part of. Um, so we do have student athletes in the audience today. And I'm wondering, uh, what advice do you have for student athletes aspiring to lead and promote inclusivity in sport? Yeah, I mean, I, I think use your voice. Um, as soon as I started using my voice, I mean, I, I don't think I started using my voice soon enough. I started using it in my senior year, but right away I started talking to the Yale athletic director. I started talking to um, the the um, house manager at the Yale AFAM house and finding ways that we could talk about um, blackness and the athletic community at Yale. So um, I think the sooner you speak up, the more comfortable you are to use your voice in the future. And that's that's when uh, the ultimate leadership comes, um, is when you're comfortable using your voice and challenging other people's opinions. Um, so I think it's important for uh, for you to speak up and, and be confident in your opinions and, and your viewpoints. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Um, so for those watching, uh, how can we get involved in Black Girl Hockey Club Canada? And are there any volunteer opportunities within the organization? Yeah, so currently, um, currently with Black Girl Hockey Club, you can find us at www.blackgirlhockeyclubca.org. Um, you can find us on our social media uh, through Black Girl Hockey Club Canada, um, as well as on my website, soroyastrong.com. Um, but in that sense, we are looking for volunteers um, to come out to our community events. Um, and honestly, I think just donate. I mean, donating helps us put on amazing events for our girls. It helps us send them care packages when they're at university. Um, it helps us send them their shoes when they need shoes um, in training in the summer. Um, so in, in that sense, donate, get involved um, and visit our website and follow us on social. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for uh, you being here today, Soroya. Um, we've made it to the end of our webinar portion, which means we can move on to the Q&A. Uh, we've received some amazing questions so far, so please continue to send your questions um, as we get into our final few minutes of the discussion. Um, starting off, here we have the GTHL has faced a lot of scrutiny recently as openly racist comments have surfaced in board meetings. Uh, what do we need in the junior level up for women's and men's hockey to change the culture and abolish the, sy the systemic oppression of BIPOC folks? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's like I said earlier, um, it's seats at the table. Um, I, I mean, I think we we see a lot of these kids being able or being being pushed out of the sport because they're not making these teams and they're not being selected and being overlooked because we have uh, white individuals at the top that are probably overlooking them for um, more reasons than just their talent. So uh, in, in that regard, Obviously, there's there's major issues at the junior level, both on the men's and women's side in, in regards to hockey. But uh, I think it's it's important that we start to have black coaches and implement um, these these things in terms of recruiting. It's it's so important to not overlook and not only recruit in specific communities and, you know, um, find these ways in which these kids can actually be included in the sport. But I mean, we know at the junior level, these are where a lot of the racially charged instances are happening um, as the kids are uh, able to fully express themselves and, and are aware of what they're saying. So um, I, I obviously it's, it's hard, but at the same time, we need seats at the table. And, and honestly, um, I don't know how we get there. I don't know how we get seats at the table, but, uh, but we will get there. We will get seats one day. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I uh, completely agree. And I think like my most meaningful experiences are when um, I get asked these questions and I can know that like people want want to listen and want to learn. Um, how did you initially get connected with Renee Hess and get involved with Black Girl Hockey Club? Yeah, so um, like I said uh, a little earlier, so it was my mom that got me connected with Renee. Um, mm -hmm. And then right from there, I started talking on panels with Black Girl Hockey Club and uh, and making sure I was involved and in, in meeting the girls. And I saw how many little Black girls played hockey and how many little Black girls are in the hockey community now and, and are really a force to be reckoned with even. So um, it, in that sense, I just was introduced to Renee through my mom and our relationship has grown grown there from there and now we're business partners. <laughs> Amazing. 
Um, I just got a question here. Uh, where will the Women's History Month be held in Toronto? Sorry? Uh, where will, oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Uh, where will the Women's History Month be held in Toronto? By Giselle. As she says, I would love to attend as I will be traveling to Toronto from Thunder Bay on March 29th. I'm looking forward to meeting other girls since I don't live in the GTA. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, we are currently working on finding a space. Uh, we're trying to uh, show ice queens to our girls at the end of the month. Um, so I will let you know as soon as I know. I Things have been a little hectic for me. I've had to cancel some things lately, obviously, with my travel, with my own hockey and whatnot. But um, but yes, we're trying to show the girls ice queens and uh, get them together for Women's History Month. But regardless, um, we will have a year-end uh event for our girls um to celebrate their their hockey season sweet amazing so um just a couple more questions uh 2020 was a defining year for projecting voices and the revolutionizing of black lives matter movement mm -hmm. um this is not this has not only affected communities but it has affected the world of sports as well uh, considering the Black Girl Hockey Camp was created in 2019, would you consider this a defining moment for the organization um, uh, in order to improve hockey culture as a more diverse and inclusive sport? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I think obviously George Floyd was was a very heightened uh, time for for racial injustice and awareness within um, within racism. So, I mean, I think it has helped hockey. Um, it helped the conversation get started. But at the same time, I think since 2019, the conversation has been started, um, but we're not sure where to go with it. Um, so in that sense, there's still so many more steps to be had. Um, but at the same time, I honestly had never been able to have these conversations until um, this happened, which is incredibly upsetting, but at the same time um, is, is a relief in a sense that we are getting to the point where we are able to to at least talk about these things. Um, and we just need more people to get uncomfortable and be uncomfortable talking about it and asking those, those important questions. The quote from the beginning of the presentation refers to sport in Canada. However, do you find any similar issues while playing in the United States? Did you experience any discrimination uh, during your career in the NCAA? Um, I, I mean, in regards to my experience in the States, I think specifically at Yale, um, I think I just expected my teammates to, um, be more educated than, than they were. And I think that meant, um, you know, not being as ignorant and making those ignorant comments as often. Um, that's what I expected in that regard. So, um, I, I think, I think I, I definitely experienced racism in the States um, and specifically within hockey. Um, I wouldn't say my teammates were were blatantly racist to me. Um, I would say they were more more ignorant and uneducated in, in the sense of, of BIPOC individuals, not even just black people. Um, and I mean, I, I mean, I do have my examples of overt and covert examples of racism, but um, I mean, I think the one example I can come up with is, is one parent called me a crossbreed um, to my, uh, to my mom, um, my mom's white, my dad's black. So um, in, in that sense, uh, there's definitely comments said here and there that you do end up internalizing, but at the same time, um, there's so much more good that has come out of um, my experiences at Yale rather than um, the, the negative. <laughs> Amazing. Um, growing up and playing hockey, uh, did you ever feel underrepresented and how did you go about managing those feelings and um, how did you prevail? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, growing up, I always felt like I had to pe put a piece of my blackness aside to fit in to hockey. Um, and I, I think that th that's because I was trying to fit in and, and be and, and look like everyone else. Um, and to be honest, I, I never really had uh, another black female role model to look up to in the sport. Um, 
there wasn't a uh, there wasn't a Sarah nurse for me to look to as as Sarah's just a few years older than me, um, and we were kind of still within the same era of playing. Um, and Angela James had retired in 1998, which is the year I was born. So in that sense, I I did see underrepresentation, but that's exactly why I play now is to be a piece of representation for the girls behind me. Amazing. Um... Raquel asks, my nine-year-old daughter recently started playing hockey, and whenever we walk into certain arenas, it feels as though she and her other teammates are viewed as other, as they moved, as they are more racially diverse than other teams. What advice do you have for my daughter in terms of taking up space in hockey as a young Black player? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of... Um, you know, being racially profiled in the arena, it still happens to me to this day. Um, so in, in that sense, I would say first off, just let, just to let you know that it, it always continues. And, um, it's always important to remember that you do belong, even when people think you don't. Um, I have people oftentimes that I'll be walking into a new arena and they, try to tell me where to go or ask me what I'm there for or ask me who I'm there to see. And I'm there to play my pro game. So <laughs> um, in, in that sense, I think you obviously do have to ignore some of it. But um, but in terms of taking up space, I mean, I think that you should be open and honest with your teammates. Um, I mean, I stopped I stopped code switching. Um, I think we I talk a lot about code switching um, throughout my Yale career. And I mean, I see a lot of the jokes that are said in the dressing room and whatnot aren't necessarily funny to me. Um, so, you know, you have your own jokes and, and the own and your own things that you say. Um, and I would encourage you don't switch it up. Just be you. Um, and that's where being unapologetically yourself comes from. Um, I mean, I think stick up for yourself, stick up for your teammates and make sure that your team is inclusive. Um, I think that when you're able to be um, yourself, you exude confidence and it allows your teammates to pick up on that energy. Um, and if you're confident, then they're going to be confident in, you know, maybe asking you a question about what you had for dinner because they knew it was different than what they had. Or um, they're able to have those, co those conversations with you about your hair and whatnot. Just because I noticed that when I was 100% myself and authentic to who I was, my teammates were more comfortable talking to me about those, um, those questions that they had. And it made them more educated. I got to educate them. They got to know my culture and I got to know theirs, to be honest. So um, just be you and, and take up space. Don't um, don't change for anyone. And I mean, just just continue to help your team be inclusive and, and just show them that you belong there, too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have another one. So just uh, from you being on the other side of this conversation, um, we have a question. As a white woman, uh, how could I or we best become an ally for BIPOC players in hockey? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot in hockey has to do with the secrecy and the um, the the lack of accountability. Um, so, I mean, as an ally, I think there's so many instances in the arena where I hear parents talking and I hear comments made. I mean, I think the first step is if you hear something, speak up. Um, I think that that's the most important piece right there, because, I mean, as soon as our white counterparts start sticking up for um, our black counterparts and, and making other white people realize that their comments aren't OK, um, that's when that's when real change can be made, because uh, obviously they they haven't been listening to us. So um, in that sense, I think true allyship is 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 obviously educating yourself um, and educating those around you, but speaking up for um, what you believe in and, and holding people accountable, I think holding people accountable is is the biggest part and um how you want to hold them accountable is is up to you <laughs> thank you um sorry i'm just checking out the chat right now um i just want to let the audience know that we will be able to ask one more question about this uh just due to time um there so here we have one there is a natural natural power differential between coaches and athletes but this can be heightened between white coaches and racialized athletes mm -hmm. uh how would you encourage uh racialized athletes to advocate for themselves and navigate this power differential 
Yeah. I mean, um, obviously your relationship with your coach is, is your own. And I think, um, all of your relationships with every different coach is going to be different. Um, but at the same time, I would say if you're on a college campus or you're at your school, um, I would say reach out to someone who is racialized and you do feel like understands you. I think that, um, coaches have, coaches aren't always able to, um, express themselves in the way that they want to with each and every single one of their players. And I think things do come across um, ignorant and, and rude sometimes in, in that regard. So I think finding your your other support system is the biggest piece. Um, I feel like I've got this question a lot is, is how do we how do we do that with our coaches? But I, I think it's making sure you have a support system outside of that because you're not going to like every single coach you have. Um, and if you have that support system outside of the arena, which is why I love being a mentor now um, is because I sadly have to tell my girls that uh, the racism probably won't subside anytime soon this season, especially if this is what you've experienced thus far. Um, but at the same time, you have people that are supporting you and want you to succeed outside of it. So honestly, I would encourage you to make sure you have your support system outside of your sport um, and, and realize that there's so much more to sport um, when you do have those frustrating moments with your with your coaches. Amazing. So um, last question, I think you kind of um, touched on it a little bit, but we are currently revamping our recreational hockey leagues for university students. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any examples or positive strategies as to how we can be proactive in supporting Black women in hockey uh, who are new to the sport. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that there are so many little black girls that want to play hockey in the area. So um, I think re reaching out to underserved communities and, um, and, and asking them, do you want to play hockey? Um, I, I think that that's going to be a huge one and a simple one at that. Um, but at the same time, I think in terms of revamping recreational hockey and and whatnot, I, I mean, I think that there needs to be um, there needs to be black individuals involved. There needs to be BIPOC individuals involved in the um, in the decisions that you're making and make sure that the uh, the board or whatever you guys have set aside represents the community that uh, you're going to be serving. Um, I think that that's the most important piece is, is making sure that you're able to understand each and every individual that you are going to be serving. Um, and when we have a board of all white individuals, we know that we're going to be missing out on something. And, and like I said earlier, diversity is a superpower and we're only better with diversity. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you again. Um, so we are just about out of time for our e uh, evening event. So on behalf of the audience, as well as the entire Department of Athletics and Recreation here at TMU, I just wanted to extend our sincere gratitude to you, Soroya, uh, for joining us today and sharing your wisdom and experience with us. For sure. um, another congratulations and good luck at the Isabel Cup finals this weekend. Uh, Soroya, where can we find and support you on social media? Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Um, cheer on the Toronto six this weekend, um, Sunday, I uh, will be on TSN and ESPN. So, um, I'm Soroy Tinker, uh, 71 on all my socials on Instagram and Twitter. Um, but otherwise you can find me with black girl hockey club or through Soroy strong. Amazing. Um, another thank you goes out to Jayla Frazier for joining us this evening and sharing her poem. Do you know, you can find her on Instagram at Jayla Frazier on your score three. Um, if you want to learn more about Black Girl Hockey Club Canada or make a donation um, to support Soroya and her organization's incredible work, uh, please visit uh, blackgirlhockeyclubca.org slash donate. Um, I just want to thank you all for joining us again today, and I hope you all have a great evening.